Friends, I invite you to remain standing in body or spirit as you are able as we read for our, our scripture lesson today. Uh, coming to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. It's a familiar story, but I've always found that God's spirit always tends to speak new words, even into familiar stories when we are paying attention uh, and seeking God's guidance. So I invite you uh, to follow along um, with the words on the screens, open your Bibles and follow along there, but let us receive these words for us today. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing money to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. I will echo the words um, of welcome that have been spoken already. It is a joy to be with you all in worship today in this uh, place in Wesley Hall. My name is Kathleen McMurray. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, pastor of modern worship and discipleship. And um, I have the amazing privilege of uh, being a part of this faith community here in Wesley Hall nearly every week. We know that as we come into this space, that we come with joys, we come with struggles, we name those and invite places to pray for those in worship. Um, but we also know that as we come into this place, we come from many different places and spaces in our lives. Um, but we are reminded and we try to remember each and every week to share that no matter where you find yourself, no matter where we find ourselves in life and in faith, that God welcomes us into this time of worship just as we are, that we are welcomed just as we are. Today, we are continuing in our worship series, Bible Stories We Think We Know, um, and we are talking about this familiar story of uh, the widow's might or the woman and her coin, um, however it is described. But I do believe um, that God has new things to teach us each um, and every time that we come before God and before the people of God in worship. So I invite us uh, now in that spirit of receiving what God has to offer to turn to God uh, in an attitude of prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Much of what I learned about generosity, I learned from my Lily and my Papa, <laughs> my grandparents. From the time that I was little, I knew of generosity from Lily and Papa by witnessing it firsthand. I saw that they would take our family on trips. We um, traveled to local fishing holes and to cabins in the woods. Um, we traveled to the beach and Disney World and uh, cruises. It was just wonderful being able to travel and spend time with family. And they were so generous um, in sharing and in offering these trips and these experiences um, to us as grandchildren and to their children. I experienced their generosity when I got my first speeding ticket. And my grandfather sat across from me at the table, looked around the room, and handed me a wad of cash. And he said, I think that you learned your lesson, and I'm going to pay this for you. Don't tell your parents. <laughs> because as a college student, that speeding ticket was a lot of money for my little budget. He was also generous with gas money, and every time I would visit them in college, would pass me a 20 while shaking my hand and lean over and say, don't tell your grandmother. And when he, it wasn't until he died, when we shared the stories of our loved ones as we do, and we were all telling these stories of my grandfather's handing us cash and saying, don't tell your grandmother that we found out she really didn't know. Um, we were uh, flummoxed. We said, surely she knew all of those years, but she did not. But she was generous as well, the two of them. 
from whom I experienced this generosity. At one point, one of our cousins had come out as gay and been disowned by his family. He was having to figure out how to pay for college that he had en <coughs> entered into and how he was going to live. And my grandparents sent him money to live off of. My grandmother, too, here in recent years, even as her health has declined, <coughs> has continued that spirit of generosity. She tells that that was just always part of their lives, always a part of their faith. That when they were a first newly married couple in their home where there was no furniture yet, except for a hand-me-down bed and a couple of chairs and some boxes that they would eat off of, there was no furniture, but already they tithed to their church because it was important, she said. That expression of gratitude, that expression of generosity to God for all that God had given them. And as her health has declined, she has continued in that generosity. She continues to tithe to the church and continues, even though she can't get out anymore, to give me checks to bring for our backpack program, for tornado relief. And even now, as her health is continuing to decline even more, she's always wanting to be generous always wanting to share. I learned about the power of generosity from them that was this expression of love and expression of faith. She and my grandfather, when he was alive, lived out their faith in this generous and abundant love of God by sharing, by being generous themselves. The story of the widow's might is a story that many of us have heard, and even those outside of Christianity have heard of before. And it is usually used as this example or this illustration um, that emphasizes the fact or the belief that every little bit counts, that your gift, no matter how small, can matter. And that is true, but those explanations, I don't believe, capture the full picture of this story that Jesus tells, these instructions that he offers. Because I think that these instructions that he offers are, are so much deeper than just a little bit is enough. It is this story and this instructions, this illustration of extravagant generosity that illustrates the extravagant generosity of God. When we look at this larger context of Jesus' words here in this teaching moment, the words might also be rather convicting when we look at them more deeply. This passage in particular comes in the midst of Jesus having some fairly controversial pronouncements there for his teaching of his disciples and his followers and those that would come and hear him. People came to Jesus asking about paying taxes. And he offers that, <coughs> that saying about giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and giving to God what is God's. In other words, we are to give to God our whole lives because our whole lives are God's. Jesus pronounces resurrection from the dead when people come questioning that there is life after death. And he says that God is a God of life and not death. Jesus offers the greatest commandment to those who are trying to trick him into choosing one law over the other. But then while teaching in the temple, Jesus says immediately preceding our passage for today, beware of the scribes who like to walk and talk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Thank you, John. John. 
Beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes and say long prayers, who take places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. That immediately precedes this passage about a widow. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowds putting money into the treasury. The treasury not being a separate building, um, but the receptacles for collecting the temple taxes and free will offerings. So imagine Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus sitting there, Jesus who has just condemned those falsely religious righteous ones who take advantage of the poor and the marginalized while trying to lift themselves up and appear good and holy. Sitting there watching as people come forward to offer money. Many rich people put in large sums, the scripture says. And I'm sure these folks were well known, these <clears throat> rich folks bringing the, the money. They were the folks with recognition and authority in the community. They received deference from those around them. After all, it was the same in that day as it is today that money often equates power. And so they're coming to put in these large sums into the treasury. And then a poor widow comes and puts in two copper coins, which are worth a penny. Amidst the crowds, amidst the people whose names were known, amidst the people who had deference and power and authority, who were giving these large sums among the crowds, this woman comes to give two pennies or two coins, which equal one penny. And I imagine perhaps there was fear and anxiety, right? What were people saying? What was she feeling as she comes to give this small amount, but that is so incredibly precious as all of these other people who are more valued and celebrated give so much. <coughs> As Jesus sees her, <coughs> as Jesus sees her, he calls to his disciples and he says, truly I tell you, this, this poor widow, this widow who is an outcast, this widow who those good righteous people take advantage of, like I just said, this widow has put in more than all of those who contributed all of that to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she had, all that she had to live on. After Jesus has just condemned the scribes, those falsely religious righteous for taking the places of honor, for devouring widows' houses, for taking advantage of the widows, this isn't only a celebration then of the widow, but sort of a condemnation of the others. How is it that those in power take everything from a widow, from one in poverty, that they don't support her like they're supposed to? Some scholars suggest that in this pronouncement, Jesus is not just lifting up the woman, but he is attacking both the scribes and the religious system that taught this woman to give everything that she had to the system without having anything left to live on and provide for herself. Because unfortunately, we know, we have seen that there have been too many instances in religious history where institutions take advantage of the vulnerable rather than caring for them as they should. But Jesus does care for her. He does, he cares for her plight, and like he so often does, he flips the script in this moment on what is considered valuable. People, many people, many of us, fall into this mindset that we think of giving to the church, to charities as optional. The money for charity giving comes out of surplus after our personal expenses have been met. Of course, those personal expenses often include necessities like entertainment and food and toys and clothes. 
The contrast between the woman offering everything that she had and all of the others who are tossing in what they can spare exhibits the false values of a society that really does not celebrate true generosity. Jesus isn't just contrasting these gifts themselves, the percentage of income for the extreme wealthy who give whatever is left over and still have plenty to live on and the woman who gives just a little, but it's everything that she has. Jesus isn't just contrasting the gifts themselves, but the heart and the value with which these gifts are offered. And in it again, he flips this script on our values as a society. There's this contrast between the widow who has no power and no standing and the wealthy who have all of the power and standing. But in her generosity, there is power. The story known as the widow's might, M-I-T-E, the widow's small offering, is actually the widow's might. M-I-G-H-T, her strength. And the might is great indeed. <coughs> a might greater than earthly power. A might greater than the grandest buildings. A might greater than the most splendid displays that are mostly privileges and entitlement in disguise because the widow's might, her strength in her generosity is God's might. A might known in love and loyalty and care, giving and grace. Over the past month, we have seen incredible devastation from hurricanes that have hit and destroyed communities and lives throughout Florida and Georgia, North Carolina and the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee. And when disasters like these happen, we see all sorts of opportunities for financial support, for financial contributions to pour in from so many people, companies and wealthy individuals donate millions of dollars and individuals, too, from all over donate time and money and items to help when disaster strikes. But I heard a story from another recent disaster that made me really think about generosity in times like these. In 2017, when Hurricane Harvey hit the state of Texas, I read a powerfully convicting story about some unlikely folks who were part of donating to the relief effort. The Texas Department of Corrections reported that over 7,000 inmates donated $53,000 to relief efforts. Money from their meager allowances, which are usually used for extra food and personal items. The average donation of these over 7,000 pe people was $8, but the value so much more. What heart, what generosity for folks whom society says are of no value to the point that they need to be locked away. And there's power in that. Power in their generosity when they have no power anymore in their lives. I find this story incredibly convicting and incredibly inspiring at the same time. And I find it incredibly powerful because generosity means something. It means something for our hearts. It means something for our faith. I learned that from my grandparents, but Jesus says it over and over and over again. Jesus talks more about money and possessions than he does about prayer. But he does so because our relationship with money and possessions can have power and control over us. Or our relationship with money and possessions can be something that we use to exercise the power of God's love around us. When we are generous, when we echo our generous God, 
with our actions, our generous God who has given all to us, when we echo that generous God in the gifts that we give, God does amazing things to transform lives, amazing things to have an impact. Another familiar story in scripture is the feeding of the thousands. It depends exactly how many thousand, depending on which gospel lesson you are reading. But in this instance, as Jesus is teaching on the Sea of Galilee, there is no food. And people began to be hungry. <coughs> and so a young boy comes forward and he offers his food. Food, fish, and bread, all that he has, all that he brought. And he gives it to Jesus. And Jesus takes this, receives it, and multiplies it. Uses it to feed thousands. That's why the traditional interpretation of this passage that you can give just a little bit, your little bit matters, is it's true. And we aren't called to give just a little bit. We are called to give our whole selves. The boy gave all that he had. The woman gave all that he had. We are called to give our lives to God because God has given us our very lives. God is a generous God and God yearns for us to be generous. To echo that generosity of God because it serves to combat our selfishness and our greed, our fear of the other, all that keeps us from loving God and loving neighbor, which Jesus says is the most important thing. Jesus talks so much, he cares so much about our relationships with money because he knows that our relationship with money and possessions can so easily have the power over us. But if we find it in ourselves to be generous, then our generosity is what has power. Then our love that we share is what has power. The power of God's generosity is rooted in love. Love of all of us, love of creation, love of a flourishing world. And when we are generous, that love is experienced and it is shared. I speak firsthand that experience with my grandparents. Their generosity was always an expression of love and of care. For us as grandchildren, for us as family members, but also for the world, for the church, for God, for those who needed love and care at the most difficult and heartbreaking times in their lives. There is might and there is power in generosity to change lives and love. It is my hope and my prayer that I am able to continue that legacy that my grandparents began. But even more than that, it is my hope and my prayer that we as people of faith, we as people of God, can share and participate in the generous giving, the generous love of a generous God, so that the power of God to transform lives can be experienced in us, through us, and around us. And we can experience more fully and witness more powerfully the presence of God in this world. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for our lives that we live, for our church in which we worship, and this community in which we share. We give you thanks for all that you give to us. And we pray today, oh God, that as we experience your generosity, that we might be transformed by it, that we might experience your love more powerfully and more fully that we might share your love more powerfully and more fully as your people, that in all we do, we participate in your kingdom coming 
on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's name we pray.